I'm Scott Hebert. Um, as you heard, I'm Vice President of Sterling Simulation, and I'm here to talk about rapid biotyping, and by, by rapid, I mean rapid, uh, for a pharmaceutical company. So a little bit about myself. Uh, again, I'm Vice President of Sterling Simulation. You already heard about that earlier. Um, I do hold a uh, bachelor's and master's degree in industrial engineering from the University of Central Florida. Uh, my specialities are in multi-method simulation modeling. Thanks, Andre. Uh, advanced data analytics and design of experiments and operations research in general. I am currently attending the University of Saskatchewan, uh, pursuing a PhD in computer science uh, for reasons that Dylan and I could go into in great detail. All right, so an executive summary of what we're, what we're talking about today. Uh, we were engaged to improve a discrete event simulation of a supply chain for a pharmaceutical client. Uh, the model was created because they had a new product they were introducing, and they wanted to check how the supply chain would react to a lot of factors of uncertainty. What we gave them was a hybrid model that offered them much more flexibility than their old model in various different ways. So just talk about the business challenge here for a few seconds. This company had a drug that was about to be launched. They hadn't launched it yet, but they were ramping up for it. They already knew they were past trials and whatnot. So this drug had only a very few different flavors or different ways to manufacture it, and they had no idea how much demand they'd have for their product. How do you build a supply chain when you don't have demand? So they wanted to know how to structure the supply chain so they could mitigate some of the risks associated with all of these factors of uncertainty. Particularly, they wanted to know how to lower their lead time. Of importance here is that the drug we were talking about was a drug that treated, at least palliatively, a life-threatening terminal illness. As such, I asked them, well, what kind of like, fill rate are you looking for? You know, what, what's your type 2 fill rate? They're like, 100%. Um, Okay, uh, but because they never ever want to see any bad press about someone needed this drug and could not get it, all right? So that was important. So what we modeled was before manufacturing of the active pharmaceutical ingredient or API of this drug, ending at tableting. So they actually created individual tablets and we, they shipped them to other people who then sold them to customers. There were two primary flavors of this drug. One of them was just basically the base drug. The other one had to do with uh, added some other agreements that actually mitigated the side effect profile of the API. And they didn't even know the demand split among the flavors. They were thinking that it would be eh, maybe 80, 20 in, form, in, in terms of the second flavor that had the minimal side effect profile, but they didn't know. And they were like, okay, can you just look at this model and can you improve it to improve certain things? Like for example, uh, various parts of the supply chain weren't holding inventory, they were just shipping it all at the end and we had those stuff. But of course, there's always a curveball in any of these projects. In this one, you have a week. We were asked to build this, improve this in a week from the time they talked to us. Because in two weeks, they had a huge like workshop they're gonna have with their actual manufacturers in the various locations and they wanna say, what do we do? So they asked us to do this. So the previous approach, as I said, was a discrete event simulation that was already built in AnyLogic. All right, so they were already familiar with AnyLogic, so we didn't have to sell them on that. Uh, this approach was very familiar to them. They knew discrete event simulation. They were mostly industrial engineers like myself. Uh, and building a supply chain discrete event simulation is a very, very well-known technique. Problem is it had no flexibility. It was a flat file. I mean, there was some hierarchy involved, but you just had end to end, and they couldn't work with it very well. So what we suggest is, well, build a hybrid model. Because the underlying structure of supply chains is that you have individual parts of a supply chain that talk to each other, and they have processes inside of them. No joke, this is the textbook example from Andre's book of building a hierarchical model of agents having discrete events and processes inside of them. So, we're like, why not use a hybrid modeling approach? So what we did, we scrapped their model. Kind of a bold move when you have a week to build this, but we basically scrapped their model. We, we went back to the value stream map they gave us, and we're like, we're gonna build this as primarily agent-based, all right? 
And these are primarily to gain flexibility and extensibility for this you know, effort. This paid off in huge dividends, but it was something of a risk. So the new model that we produce for them is simpler to use, much simpler, especially for people who are not modelers. The end users wanted to be able to say, hey, what happens if we do this? They wanted to be able to pull a bunch of levers and that kind of stuff. And we're like, well, a flat screen simulation is not as good as an agent-based model for that. It allows code reuse. We actually created very, very simple constructs that we reuse all over the place. Um, and we actually allowed them to produce and change their supply chain at runtime. So in other words, not only um, which suppliers they want to use and all these other things, they wanted to be able to say, what happens if we do it in three steps instead of two? This is you know, just a part of what we had to do. Oh, and yes, we did get it done on time, at least for their workshop. So in general, the trade-offs between their approaches, DES was very familiar and dispensable to the client. However, it was inflexible at least as they created it and didn't have all the features they wanted. Hybrid is very, very robust. Uh, and it's also very configurable, but it's very unfamiliar to the point that when I showed them the new model, the reaction was, what is this? They had no idea how to look at this and understand what was going on in the model. This was a hurdle that we had to overcome. So I'm going to talk about the model fairly briefly. Uh, the model we'll be discussing actually is not the model we built in a week. It's a, a one that we built on a follow-on project because it would be very difficult to reconstruct it. But it has, the core is the same. Uh, and if, uh, I've marked some later developments that we knew were mm, done later. So we have several types of agents. Some of these are what I call theoretical agents that actually have agency and they actually talk to each other. Other ones are primarily to use the agent API in any logic for dynamic creation and you know, just holding things. The model uh, runs for about five years because that is the extent to which they have their forecast, which is, a, which is rather amusing because when I first was asked, I asked, well, how long does this model run? They're like, uh, till 2030. Okay, well, that's, you know, 13 years. And the result was that they only had their increasing demand for five years. So you actually had an, in, an area of increasing demand and it just plateaued and just kept going straight for like another seven years. And the interesting part is that there were some certain things, certain issues they had in their supply chain that didn't show up until it went to steady state. Because before that, the increasing demand was hiding a lot of the issues they were having. But then they decided, well, we don't know what our demand's gonna do, so let's just chop it down to five years. Wasn't exactly in favor of that change, but that's what they decided. Sorry. So these are the six primary agents in types in the model. We have locations, processes, steps, and those are all hierarchical to each other. Then we had batch types, and we have basically shipping batches and production batches. And we'll cover each of those very briefly. So the location agent or is basically a facility location. It can have multiple processes in it. This is mainly because certain products stayed in the location. They produced it and then they immediately consumed it for a different process. Uh, it also, this is the part where they handle raw material inventory. So all the uh, you know, stuff that needs to be charged. And then if you have a resource that's shared among several processes, it'd be held here. And there was one in particular that had, at least they thought initially, a huge impact on their issues. Process is a single production line. So this is a process to build one product. It can have one or more production steps defined from an input file and changed at runtime. Uh, it could have process level changeovers. You have all these other you know, take things. And also the finished goods inventory for any given process was held inside its process. It also, this was the primary decision logic was held in this process. Process step is a simple single step. It could have ch its own changeovers, like minor changeovers. Etc. Again, this is primarily for dynamic creation and destruction, not that we destroy, destroy them. So batches, these are the, the product types. What could they make? Now, these are not just, oh, product A, product B, the API, an intermediate step, or the finished tablets. This is also, uh, another problem in the supply chain is that they only could produce it in certain batch sizes. So 
you could choose to be, well, I can produce 40 kilograms of the API or 80 kilograms, but nothing in between in some cases. They also had variable yield. So there were all these, all the information related to a, uh, the, what they could produce was here. Then a uh, production batch agent was a produced batch. This had an actual quantity assigned to it. We know its size, we know its you know, amount. Again, this is primarily a data structure that was moved around. Then we had a shipment request or shipment agents that represented a shipment of product from one location to another. And it knows the amount it wants to ship. And then it basically had to pull all the production batches to ask, uh, can, you do, can I use you? And, and how much do I need of you? Um, at the original point, in the original model, they said that any process could, uh, any, they could ship partial batches of any product. They then later changed that to say you could only uh, uh, ship partial batches for the final tableting, after the final tableting stuff. It was, this was how chaotic it was. was. And then basically, again, this is primarily a data structure that was held in RMI and finished goods. So the primary logical elements that we had here, you had MRP scheduling later. The initial model had something that was a little bit. Uh, but basically, the MRP logic now basically looks at what they have, it's basic MRP, and it's run every month. Even if they, didn't, they couldn't produce every month because that was uh, something they were looking at, we looked at every month to make sure we uh, adjusted all the demands and so how much we should produce. And it used a proprietary process by which we mean we went to go talk to their schedulers and ask them, how do you do this? And we implemented whatever they did. Uh, the production is a discrete event process. I mean, there's no reason not to use this. It had variable yield. And the variability in the yield created most of the other decisions in the supply chain. For example, I can't say, always say I want two batches to be shipped to the next one. I have to ship so much you know, actual material. And then shipping, when to ship? Do I ship, every, do I ship everything as soon as I get it? Not likely. Do I, if I can't ship, if I, I can't meet my entire demand, do I ship what I have? Do I wait until I can meet full demand? These are all questions that we had to get answered. So the basic demand explosion was basically take the demand for any of these products, determine when it's needed, you know, time phase it, and then this becomes, and then once you time phase it and you do all the calculations, this becomes the demand for the prior step. The production question, at least initially, was, well, I know what my demand, my current uh, demand I need to produce for is. I know what I, my current inventory is. I know what the safety stock level I want. Is that a positive or negative number? If it's positive, I produce. If not, it's not. And then the other, uh, then charge inventories, and then you start production. So uh, the notion is in the verification of the model. The original model had, ver uh, had several issues. However, it was sufficient for answering the questions they had in the workshop. Uh, the current version of the model has gone through extensive testing. Um, in fact, too extensive. Um, I had to explain to uh, the client that, you know, we have this agent type. It has the same logic as every other agent of this type. Why are you testing every single agent? And that was something I was having to explain and stuff like that. Um, and that was a concern as well. But as far as validation, how do you validate a supply chain that doesn't exist? How do you know the model works? Well, we haven't fully validated yet, although that's actually not true. We actually got confirmation of validation yesterday. Um, what we did is that since we had a model that was fully configurable, we actually took an existing supply chain and checked to see if the model could validate that to, to that supply chain. That would at least know the logic works and makes them feel more comfortable. And that's what we actually found out yesterday, is that the guy involved was like, yep, this is good. Now, once you have a production, once you actually start getting real data, there's a, there's a technique called particle filtering that can be very, very useful for making sure your model isn't going off the rails. It's a way of regrounding your data. Um, I would suggest, if anyone has interested, uh, look at Dr. Osgood's uh, and, uh, work on particle filtering. He's my advisor, supervisor at University of Saskatchewan. So, what we what were we able to do for the company? First of all, they fully embrace simulation as a tool, and they really like it. Uh, they've already asked us to model a new another new product that was just released from testing, and the the uh, product that we use to actually validate the model. They want a version of the model for their supply chain, which is a much more mature supply chain. Uh, they really want to know how to reduce lead time because 
Uh, lead if they can reduce lead time, that reduces inventory, and you'd imagine with 100% targeted, you know, type two fill rate, that's going to cause a lot of inventory buildup. So that's something they're really interested in. So what's the impact for all of you, though? I mean, we're talking about what the thing is, and the important thing is that if you can properly do hybrid modeling, you can drastically reduce the amount of time needed to build a model, because you do need to have some theoretical knowledge of multi-method modeling. But it allows for very natural design. We actually had f far fewer objects and things in our model than the model they already had. And we were able to produce it in a week, whereas I don't know exactly how long it took them to build their original model, but it was far more than a week. Um, but you also can do easy testing and verification, particularly if you're using agent classes. And then, of course, this makes very obvious bonuses if you're trying to create a rapid prototype or a proof of concept model but it has effects otherwise. So the next steps for this uh, modeling effort, again, ground the model using particle filters. By the way, this is not the easiest thing in the world with, an, with a non system dynamics model. That's gonna be an important part of research for us going forward. We also are looking at shifting the, model, the entire model code based in e-logistics. There's a lot of stuff that we had to program into the model that e-logistics just handles for us, and it is very, very, crucial for them to be able to create these. If we can put in their you know, processes and steps into a larger any logistics model, it would greatly ease the ability for them to use these models and gain useful insights from them. Um, so, well, I'll, I'll just go straight to the model so we can talk about this. Um, if you want to, you can, should be able to just hit play on this. Yeah, it's running. You may need the positive lines. This is the input file. As you can see, it's very bare bones, but this is not the current input file. This is a, a, an earlier version because this was completely stripped of any information that the company had. So you can see it, and it's, there's lots of different areas to it, um, but it's, I don't want to dwell on it too much. Um, and then when we go to the model, if you run it, um, this is like sort of like, this is what they wanted to see in terms of the interface. This is how they think in th terms of things. And um, if something's happening in an, uh, an object, it's basically, you know, it's, it's highlighted. You have green circles for different uh, things. This is inside one process. We're looking at the, uh, yeah, finished goods inventory for one of the products. We're actually looking at, we're graphing three things. What is the one month of supply needed, you know, month of coverage. Then you have three months of coverage, and then we have another one that's actually showing the actual inventory, so you can actually see what's going on over time. And then we're also getting all kinds of information, like reporting as to what was the actual decisions made and what were we doing in every step. So that's, that's sort of where we are at that point. Um, I will point out that this is completely made up data that we just put in here because we couldn't use the real data. Um, and this, and as run right now, the, 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 the the supply chain cannot keep up with demand. So you're gonna see a very different thing there. So anyway, that was like the model really quick. So um, I wanna thank you all for listening to me and I'd like to open the floor to questions at this point. Questions, comments, concerns? Yes. So, so the question was about the robustness of the supply chain. How can you actually look at fill rates? So the interesting part about this is that the metrics that they were using were like, let's look at lead times, and we're, we were starting to look at a wide variety of experiments. They're, that's sort of what they're going to at the next point, is what can we do to, they're asking us a really wonderful question. We wanna minimize both our lead time and our costs. Um, last I checked, those were competing objectives, um, so we're gonna be looking at that. But the question is, is let's look at the overall concerns, and we want to create, as you said, a robust example, but we also need to get a, as best as possible a good, you know, thing. So I've actually pushed back on them on their, on their fill rate question because 100% fill rate will create a ridiculous amount of inventory. Um, but the model does actually mo monitor that and say, okay, well, what can we do to assist in those, each of those areas? Did I answer your question or did I? Okay, thanks. Anyone else? All right, well, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.